Aloha and welcome to this episode of the Hawaii Smooth Jazz Connection. I am your host, Gwendolyn Harris. My guest today is a contemporary jazz pianist, music composer and producer, author, radio host, and creator of the New Urban Jazz Lounge. He started playing music at an early age and has been in the music industry for over three decades. He has been the recipient of many awards and accolades and has worked with Gerald Albright, Lori Williams, Marion Meadows, Adam Hawley, Chuck Lorber, and Pieces of a Dream. This is just to name a few. The list goes on. I am so happy to have him here today. Let's welcome Mr. Bob Baldwin to the show. Aloha, Bob. Aloha from the East Coast. How are you? How are you? I am well. First of all, I want to thank you for being here because it's 11 o'clock where you are <laughs> so it's past your bed it's past your bedtime i'm just getting riled up i'm ready to go write about <laughs> 10 songs before you go to sleep <laughs> well i appreciate you i really do appreciate you being here so we're going to get our little chat started how did you get into the music industry well um i got into music through my father who um passed away about uh, 13 years ago he was a pianist and a jazz pianist and a very good pianist. Um, we lived in the uh, county of Westchester, which was just north of New York City. And um, Westchester was kind of like this little uh, sleepy uh, county that sat on top of New York City, but there was great musicians and artists like uh, Gordon Parks lived in the area. Hugh Masekela, when he defected from South Africa, lived in Westchester County to stay there for many years while I was going to school, Manhattan School of Music. And so I was surrounded by some really great uh, people. My dad taught me how to play and he realized I was a musician. I had musical talent at age five mm. when I was uh, in kindergarten. He found out I had perfect pitch and I was, his little, uh, I was his little musical toy around the house. He would invite his musical friends over and he'd tell them, hey, play, play a note on the piano and they'd hit a note and I'd call it out like 50 feet away. It'd be like, oh, wow, this is amazing. This guy's <laughs> genius. I'm like, genius. I'm, I'm just learning how to read. You know what I mean? <laughs> read, read books, you know? But uh, I learned at a very young age. And then my sister had all the great Motown records, Aretha Franklin, Stax records, you know, all the soul records of, of the day in the late 60s. So my music today is a kind of a mishmash of, of those two genres with little gospel thrown in there. Oh, nice. Now, uh, we know that you play the keys. Do you play anything else? What other, what, what other musical instruments do you play, if anything? Yeah, I just play piano and keyboards. That's enough. There's 88 keys that I, <laughs> I'm just going to learn how to work all 88 in the song one day. Well, maybe, you know, one day we'll see. <laughs> but the piano is, is enough, trust me. I hear you. I hear you. No, I, I want to learn how to play. I want to learn how to play the piano. I think I'm too old. Nice. <laughs> never, never too young. Now, you own 26 of your own studio projects, 13 of which have peaked top 20 status on the Billboard Jazz Contemporary Jazz Album Charts. Tell us why it's important for an artist to own their own music or projects. Well, in an unexpected word, COVID. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, learned, I, I learned when that happened that, well, I, okay, I, I actually did something intelligent for a change. But um, it was very important for me to own the material because A, you get more per, per unit when you, when you sell something. Mm -hmm. B, you're not sharing it with a record company or a manager or an agent. You know, this is so many people that got their hands in the pot. Um, we creative people always seem to get paid last. And that's across the board in the music business from the, from the biggest to the smallest. They seem to just want to just pay the creators of the content last. So I just, you know, I learned 30 years ago on my second record deal with Atlantic Jazz, when I started looking at these accounting statements, I'm like, this math is not adding up to anything. <laughs> okay. And so I learned then that I need to learn how to read contracts. I had to, I had to make sure my accounting was tight. And so I realized that at that point that it was, I had to, I had to, I had to work my way into owning my material. So it started 30 years ago. Now I'm pretty sure you put all that in a book entitled, and, and I love the name of, <laughs> I love the name of this book. You better ask somebody staying on top of your career in the friggin' music business. That's right. 
<laughs> Which I now, love the title. Um, I need to update that book because before I wrote the. I wrote that book before streaming started to be a big thing in the music business. I, I need to insert a chapter, but there are definitely some pertinent points in that book that are, that are applicable today. One of them is, is the whole contract piece, knowing your accounting, um, knowing how to self-manage yourself and not be so codependent on other people. Um, the more hats you can wear, the better. Um, I don't do my own artwork though. I just, I just got to tell you that I can I don't go all the way with it now. I mean, I've seen people just go a little bit too far doing everything themselves, like doing your own artwork and putting some bad fonts or pictures on, on a cover. Uh, you know, to the point where you got to say, okay, I need help. Let me hire the right people to do the best job instead of me doing everything. <laughs> yeah. Don't you, it doesn't hurt to ask for help. Oh, I know yeah. that. I know that from experience. Yep. Exactly. Now the new Urban Jazz Lounge, that's your, that's your radio network. What is yes. the reasoning? Why did you start that? Well, in 2008, um, well, before that, I, you know, I, learned, I learned radio way back in college. Um, went to school at Geneva College in Beaver Falls, Pennsylvania, and fell in love with radio, caught the radio bug like almost instantly, had friends of mine who were on the radio. I wanted to I wanted to get in on the radio and I love jazz. So that was my, that was my, that was my entree into jazz and radio. And what happened was that um, after running out of money going to college because Ronald Reagan came into office and my tuition went, went up and my aid went down and I was like, oh my God, I'm out of money. And so I ended up having to move back, back to New York, landed an internship at WBLS and caught the radio bug even more. In fact, I met some really great, you know, DJs there. One was uh, Frankie Crocker, one of the mm -hmm. one of the great New York DJs. And at the time, BLS was number one in the country for for R and B. And so, long story short, um, in 2008, uh, there was a station called CD 101.9 in New York, which was the largest smooth jazz station in the country at the time. Mm -hmm. And just out of out of the clear blue, they decided to turn their switch off and switch to rock. I never forget, I got a text message like an hour and a half before it happens. Guy sends me a text, he says, yeah, CD 101 is about to flip. I'm like, oh no. And he didn't tell me what it was gonna flip to. So I waited, he said, and about 15 minutes before it flipped, he sends me another text and says, they're flipping to rock at four o'clock. It was like 3.45. I'm on a highway in New Jersey and I'm waiting, waiting, waiting. Turn the station on and that thing flipped to like, like ELO or something. Yeah, you know, it just went from like Grover to ELO in like two seconds. I'm like, oh my God, they did it. Blew my mind. I had experienced that about 20 years prior to that. So it wasn't my first shock. Anyway, what happened was that right after that, several stations flipped from smooth to like news and rock and country around around the country. And most of those stations were owned by Clear Channel. So in about a year and a half, 24 stations flipped like overnight. No notice. And then there was no smooth jazz between Boston and Orlando, Florida. It was like this big gaping hole. And so I was like, wow, this is, this is kind of serious. So what I decided to do is start this two hour show, which kind of filled in the gap for people who are looking for music, mm -hmm. uh, looking for indies, looking for just anything new that they didn't have to go scrounge around on the internet for. So I, it was kind of like this one centralized location. They could hear what, you know, what's the latest music and that's how it started in 2008, October 1st. And every Friday, I mail the show to 55 stations around the country. Wow, and, it, and it's still going. Still going, and I, I've done it every week since then. It was like, so I'm up to like week number 652 or something like that. Ooh. Wow. I'm now, like it's inter <laughs> I'm sorry? I'm like the Iron Man. Oh, yeah. You know, it's interesting that you said that because they did that in Hawaii here. Our smooth jazz station that we had here, they just did away with it. They just did away with it. And that's why no like notice, you, right? no, I had to I had to come up with something. So that's why I do my my radio show um, on, on Sundays. But the question um, that I do have for you is, you know, smooth jazz is, is kind of like, I love it, you know, but it's kind of, it, it, it's not there yet. Where do you see the future of smooth jazz going? Right now, I see it having a little bit extra R&B sound to it. Um, mm -hmm. I'm checking out some of the, a lot of the young musicians. A lot of them come out of church. 
And so they're inf influxing um, some gospel, um, the energy of gospel into like an instrumental uh, gospel track. Mm -hmm. um, There's some really, really interesting musicians coming up. You know, one that comes to mind is uh, Marcus Anderson, a real good friend mm -hmm. of mine. I've, I've mm -hmm. known him for a long time since he was in his early, early 20s. Before he went, before he went on the road with Prince, and but he came out of the church, um, mm -hmm. him, him and his brother. Um, in fact, I think he was a member of a church and you know playing in the church band before he got called to, to work with um, uh, Prince uh, after Mike Phillips left. So it was, um, I think it's, it's a lot of the energies between gospel, R and B, and jazz. They're adding a little bit more, a little more funk into into the music. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not as um, it's not as laid back as it used to be. There, there's definitely a different kind of energy, and um, I don't know. We'll, we'll, it's, it's interesting to see how it's evolving. Yes, yes, it is. Now you work with an artist um, who I went to school with, Miss Lori Williams. How how did you um, come to work with her? Well, it started when I was looking for music for the for the show, mm -hmm. and um, went on Twitter, uh, Twitter and saw this young lady who was working with uh, Mesa and Phil Perry and had, you know, had a couple of CDs out. And then I had a chance to listen to this track that she did called Body and Soul. Mm -hmm. And I was expecting this like laid back ballad from the you know, 60s and just, you know, just her putting a nice sultry spin on it. And this thing kicked in with some like hot Latin. I was like, <laughs> what the, <laughs> this girl. Let me let me look let me look her up some more. So then I found some other music, and she did a track called Island, which was written by Yvonne Lynn, the great Brazilian songwriter, uh, which I had also done like a year before. Mm -hmm. And so um, I had a show in uh, in Maryland, and asked her if she would would sit in, and she agreed to. And we did Island together, which was really amazing for the first time. And we just stayed in contact, and we started working together. And here we are, probably twenty five tracks later. You know, putting putting together some really great music. Um, in fact, I've, I've had the honor of producing her her next project called uh, A New Day. Mm. Uh, I worked on uh, Out of the Box with her, and so I love that one. Yeah, I, I think she's got a nice little slot for uh, for smooth. I mean, she could do straight ahead all day long, but there's also some positioning for her in smooth that I think she's going to break through. Yes, Lori has an amazing voice, and the, and the two of you together. Are, are awesome. So I'm looking forward to see more coming from the both of you guys. Yeah, we, uh, you know, we get on the same page real quick in the studio. I mean, we just, we just agree and go with a vibe and, you know, it just, it just works so smoothly. She's a, she's a true professional and a great artist and a wonderful person and a great yeah. mom. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I, I'm so sure of that. Um, you know, you know, that's my Hampton. That's my Hampton sister. So, yeah, yeah. you know, Thank hey, you Lori, so. if you're watching. <laughs> Lori! <laughs> now, COVID has put a stop. You know, things are starting to open back gradually, slowly and stuff like that. Um, but COVID, for the most part, put a stop to everything. All of you artists, musicians stopped, stopped touring, everything. What did you do to get through that? Um, a lot of drinking. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> That was a joke. That was a joke. Um, I had to first of all know that I was solidified financially, and you know, based on the things I had done the years before, owning my material, and really using that as my my basis for um, a livelihood. Mm -hmm. Thank God I did that. I'm glad I didn't base my career on live shows. If I did, I would have been out in the street somewhere right now. So I'm very, very, uh, very blessed that I had made the decision. Thanks, thanks to God. And so um, I stayed home and just like the first six months of COVID, I stayed home and worked on like 35 tracks. I was just like a, I was like a nut. I was just, just creative. I was in this really great creative mode. Mm -hmm. And um, I, was working, I was working on Lori's stuff. I was working on my stuff. I was working on a couple of other artists as well. And uh, also started to put together a, um, a live stream. I was rehearsing for that. I was put, writing music for that. So all in all, the first six months, it was like about 35 songs. Most of them are coming out now. You know, we had to wait a minute for things to you know, kind of settle in, but um, the audience is getting ready to experience you know, a barrage of, of tunes that are, that are coming out now. So that's what I did. I stayed home, did a lot more writing. 
Because I, I, you know, I, had, I had more time on my hands, you know? Yes. Yes. It, it, it forced you all. Like I, I spoke to another artist um, the other day. Um, it forced you all to stay home with your, with your families because usually you guys are touring you know, staying away from home. And now you had to stay home and, and get some work done and stay home with your with your family. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Now you collaborated with so many people, Bob, so many, and I'm not even gonna list them because it's, it's just a lot, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think it's flashing on the screen, that's your collaboration like wall. Like you know, I, I can't even, I can't even fathom. I can't even say that. So, and this is gonna be a hard question. It's kind of a two-parter, okay? So which was your favorite collaboration? Wow. <laughs> I was like asking someone if they had 10 kids. Exactly. Like, oh. I don't know if I can answer that one. Uh, but one of them that I really enjoyed working with was Grover Washington Jr. Okay. Someone who I grew up listening to for like many years since I was like 10 or 11 to finally meet him like 20 years later and to find out just how cool he was. Uh, was a real thrill. Uh, I worked with him between 1991, um, and he, I mean, stayed in contact with him even, even up to his uh, his passing. Um, I used to bump into him on the road. If I if, if he was playing in a town I was in, he would invite me backstage, and we, you know, it was it was just that that cool. So it was it was a real pleasure to work with someone of that stature at a young age. You know, coming up in the business it was very inspiring. I would say that's definitely a highlight for sure. Now, second part to that question is, who would you, who would be your dream collaboration? Somebody that you have not collaborated with yet. Wow. And I'm pretty sure you won't do it. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> well, um, I had told uh, Michael Collier a couple of months ago, Stevie Wonder. Mm. Uh, and then, then about two weeks later, he decided he's going to move to Ghana. So I don't know if that's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Unless I go, go find him out there. Go knock on his hut, hey brother. Know <laughs> what you said? Um, so I like, um, you know, I've worked with so many great musicians and artists. Um, you know, I'm, I'm talking to Gerald Austin right now from the Manhattan's. Mm -hmm. uh, where we're talking about a possible collab. I love his voice, and he's still he's still on top of his sound. Man, he sounds amazing. Um, man, I can't I can't even think right now. It's just a lot of I, you know Jeff Lorber is somebody I like to work with. Uh -huh. I like to work with different keyboard players just to see how how their brain you know functions. Right. Um, we all think look, we all approach music a little differently, and it's always got this you know sense of intelligence that goes along with because you know music and piano is just this crazy intricate thing that's you're dealing with notes, you're dealing with math, you're dealing with sequences, you're dealing with all kinds of integers. You know, everybody thinks music is music, but there's there's a mathematical element to it. So I like to work with different piano players and keyboardists and, and see and see where they're up, what they're up to. But uh, oh. those at the top, I think George Benson is also someone I like to work with. Mm. And I like to shake uh, Quincy Jones's hand, just, ah. to, just to let him know how amazing of a career he's had and taking Michael Jackson from here to here. You know, just mm -hmm. those are the kinds of things I would like to do if, if I had to put them on my bucket list. Well, with that, we are going to take a little break and watch a performance of you in action. So let's watch Mr. Bob Baldwin in action. <laughs>
Yeah, well, I hope that you enjoyed that video. Bob, we just have a few more minutes left yeah. in this segment. Um, tell us about a organization that you are involved with. Uh, well, Lori Williams has been developing this uh, organization called Positive Music for Positive Minds. And um, it's basically, she has basically taken her 25 years of um, education in, in, the, in the high school, you know, public school sector and applying music uh, as, a, as a medium to teach kids, not only about music, but life and just, it's like a, she's using it as a, as a tool to build up confidence of, of young, young children who might be scared to get on stage or, you know, cause you know what, if you're scared to get on stage to sing, then you're scared to do other things. So she tries to uh, work through people's um, mental barriers so that she can get really the, the true essence of, of the talent of people. And she's, uh, you know, something that's uh, growing slowly but surely. And, you know, during this time of COVID, I think, you know, kids now, they, they need more confidence now than ever. And this is a good time to uh, to develop some really you know beautiful jewels out there that, that that are ready to be you know buffed up and pushed out there. And so I'm I'm wishing her uh, you know I have nothing but but praise for for what she's doing with her organization. Now, awesome! Really quick, what advice would you give a new artist that's coming into the industry? Don't do it. <laughs> Go back to college. No. Um, <laughs> Stay in school. No. <laughs> <laughs> Work at McDonald's. No. I'm just um, one of the main things that I think for longevity, because you can survive in this business without having, you know, like a number one hit. Because that, I mean, that's kind of a, a roll of the dice. It's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a poker game. You can really develop a career for yourself if you work on your, your, your gift. Um, and work on your, your body of work. But I think for me, body of work is more important than one or two hits here and there. So I think it's very important that, you know, you get real focus, you get honed in on what you're good at, develop that into a body of work, into some content, something that you can own and, you know, pass on to your kids or pass on to your family when you pass. You know, so to own your material is so important in terms of developing uh, wealth and talent for yourself. So that's the one thing that I definitely encourage any artist coming up. Just write as much as possible, learn your craft, you know, and just put that knowledge out there as much okay. as possible. Okay. Well, I thank you so much for, for being here with us. Really quick, tell people where they can find out where you're going to be performing at, um, where they can find out more about you. Go ahead and give your website. Absolutely. Uh, Bob Baldwin.com. B O B Baldwin.com. That's my artist page. If you want to buy any of my music, you can go to City Sketches Records.com. Uh, you can also find that on the Bob Baldwin.com site. I have about probably about 15 CDs there available for sale. I've got this uh, great, uh, I got this great catalog where you can actually buy one, one download of my entire catalog. It's only available uh, on my website. And uh, for radio, you go to newurbanjazz.com. There's any W, newurbanjazz.com. Awesome. Well, Bob, Mr. Baldwin, I thank you so much for being here. Um, it's probably 1130 right there where you are now. Thank you. You can go to bed now or you can go to work, you know, I'm as go you to work say. Uh, I'm, I'm retired. I'm ready to go. Ready to well, listen. again, I thank you so much. And to my viewers, I thank you also for being here. Until next time, aloha and God bless.